Hi, this is Bertha Fries, and this is the Bayesian Machine Learning and Information Processing class. Today, we're going to be talking about discrete data. And um, this is in contrast to the previous class when we talked about continuous data and uh, the uh, standard distribution that is most often used is the, uh, the Gaussian distribution there. And we have for discrete outcomes also a similar kind of distribution that is used uh, for almost all cases. Uh, as we will see, this is the, uh, the categorical distribution and uh, we're going to do Bayesian inference for that distribution in this class. Um, this is going to be a short class um, because it's not very difficult. Um, we have kind of done this before in the Bayesian machine learning overview when we talked about the, uh, we did an example, the coin toss example, and we uh, assumed uh, a Bernoulli distribution, and then we had a, for uh, outcomes, and we had a beta prior and did Bayesian inference. Here we're going to do the same thing, but now for uh, a K-sided uh, coin. So uh, for instance, a die, a die has six sides. And so we just scale up the dimension, but aside from that, there's not much uh, difference. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to recall um, the data generating distribution that we used for uh, the coin toss. And um, we have as outcomes heads or tails, but let's encode them now as uh, zero and one. So X, the outcome is going to be zero if it lands on tail and, head, and one if it lands on heads. And uh, let mu be the probability of heads, then we can write this model as the probability for X for outcome, given the parameter mu is this expression here. This is called the Bernoulli distribution. It's just a function, a function with arguments mu and x, but and you can interpret it in two ways, as we have discussed. You can interpret it as uh, well as a data generating distribution. Then you assume that mu is given and it's an expression in x, where x are the outcomes, it's the data. Or in machine learning, we often uh, observe the outcomes and we want to infer something about the parameters. So if I observe the x, then this is an expression in mu, and we call that function the, uh, the likelihood function. Um, note that uh, in this expression, these exponents, x and y minus x, kind of uh, serve as uh, selectors. Um, if x equals zero, then this first factor uh, vanishes, and so um, uh, I, I have a one, uh, 1 minus uh, 0 is 1. So it says uh, the probability for uh, x equals 0 uh, is 1 minus mu, and the probability for x equals 1 is mu. That's what this formula says. Um, now let's scale that up. Let's scale up to uh, a die, which has six sides, but more generally k, capital K. And uh, how now are we going to encode outcomes? And there are two ways of doing this. The most obvious way is you're going to say, well, X can uh, land, if it lands on the first uh, uh, phase, then it's, I'm saying X equals one, and on the second phase, X equals two, and so forth. So for the, when it lands on the sixth phase, phase uh, X equals six. That's one way, that's not wrong. There is another way, namely um, something that's called a one-hot coding scheme. Um, I'm gonna encode my outcomes in a vector, so x1 through xk, where each element in this vector is either a zero or a one, and it's only one if well, basically, if the die landed on the number of faces that corresponds to the entry in this factor. So, in other words, xk is 1 if the die landed on the case face. To make that more concrete, if I have a real die, so six faces, and the die lands on the third face, I'm going to encode that with this factor. So I have a one at the third location or the third index in the vector, and the rest is zero. And uh, if I withdraw, let's say, uh, lands on the fifth face, 
then uh, of course uh, uh, x5 equals 1 and the others are all 0. That's an alternative. I can also encode my six outcomes this way. So which is better? Well, in practice, it turns out that if we start working, uh, if we start working with likelihoods and priors and want to compute posteriors, this one hot coding scheme actually uh, is more convenient, gives analytical answers. So that's what we're going to be using. And this is basically the, um, this point that uh, when you have discrete outcomes, that you should use this one hot encoding scheme for outcomes is the most important point of this class. Um, and so if we then take that idea, then how do we encode, how do we make the data generating distribution now for, uh, for a die? All right, uh, just imagine K here, capital K is six. I'm gonna have probabilities P for x sub k equals 1, so it lands on the k's face equals mu k. So we're going to have six probabilities, six probabilities, or six parameters, mu 1, mu 2, through mu 6. And the sum of these probabilities, of course, have to be, uh, has to be 1. And the data generating distribution, um, I can write it in the same way, or let's say uh, um, an uh, extension of the idea of the Bernoulli distribution. I'm going to use these XKs from this one hot encoding scheme as selectors. So um, if you look at this expression here, now this says the probability that um, X3 equals 1, so that it lands on the third phase, that means all x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, x3 equals 1, x4, 5, 6 equals 0. That means everything falls away except for mu3. So this says probability for x3 equals, zero, equals 1 equals uh, mu3. And of course, the probability for x2 equals 1 is mu2 and so forth. So it's again the idea with this one hot coding scheme to use these outcomes as selectors for the probability. It's a simple extension of the idea of how we write the Bernoulli distribution, and this is a short way of writing it. This is called the categorical distribution, and it's just the generalized Bernoulli distribution for, uh, for k dimensions. Good, so now uh, let's uh, learn the probabilities for a die. I have a loaded die and possibly unfair die. I don't know what the probabilities are. And I'm going to throw this die lots of times, let's say uh, capital N times. D is X1 through X capital N. Uh, and I do so the capital N rolls of a K sided die. And I'm going to encode my outcomes by this one hot encoding scheme. So I'm going to say on the nth roll, xk or n sub nk equals 1 if the nth row lands on the k's face. And otherwise it's 0. And that means that I can now write basically the, uh, my likelihood function, right? Because the likelihood function is just the multiplication of this categorical distribution over all time steps, assuming that all throws are independent, and uh, we may assume that. Um, so you're going to get this expression here, and in this expression notice that n only appears here in the exponent as a subscript here. So we can rewrite it in this way, and if I call the sum of nk's overall, let's say overall time steps, mk, I get this expression, and now n is gone out of this. This means m, mk is really the total number of occurrences that we threw ki's. Uh, so if we want to we make a data generating distribution here, where the particular sequence of uh, heads, tails doesn't matter. The only thing that seems to matter, that appears to matter, is the number of times I threw um, 
uh, a four or the number of times I threw three or the number of times I threw five and so forth. Not the actual order of these, uh, um, of these occurrences. But that's, uh, that's okay. That's because we assumed that these throws were independent. So there is no ordering. Um, so it's good that that actually falls out of the formula once I assume that these throws are independent. Now you recognize this. I mean, the D is, uh, is given. You recognize this as a likelihood over mu. This is, uh, M case are given because the M case are, are computed out of the observations X and K. So this is just an expression over the mu case. It's the likelihood function for the mu case. And I just need now a prior. And you may remember when we uh, threw this, uh, when we did this experiment for the coin toss, we had uh, a, beta, a beta prior that looked a lot like the Bernoulli distribution, it just had a different kind of normalization factor. Well, we have the same thing, th same thing here. We have an, uh, there's an extension of the beta prior called the Dirichlet prior. And that's the one that we uh, should be using here. So the Dirichlet prior is a distribution for mu now, and there is an, uh, a whole bunch of gammas, gamma functions here, but it's not a function of mu. So for given alpha, this is just a number. This whole thing is just a normalizing, uh, the, the, it's just a number that makes sure that if I sum this whole thing here over all mu k's, that's going to end up being 1. Um, importantly, what I see here on the right hand side in this Dirichlet distribution, I see mu k to something alpha k minus 1, and that looks a lot like the likelihood function. Sorry, I should do it like this. So what I see here looks very much like the likelihood function. Notice in the likelihood function, the MKs are the number of times that you threw, uh, that the, well, that the die landed on the K's face. Here, alpha K are parameters that you choose. Um, and so they have as an interpretation sort of the imagined number of times that the die landed on the case face um, prior to making all the observations. So you can, for instance, um, if you would set the uh, alpha case, all alpha case to um, uh, a thousand, then you get an uh, a flat distribution. If all the alpha k's are the same, you get a flat distribution, right? And um, um, because they are sort of the pseudo counts, right? Now we want to learn um, about uh, basically the posterior now for mu. So we have here a likely, we have here a likelihood, and we have here prior. So then we know that the posterior for mu given my prior counts, but also incorporating the data, so the actual counts in the observations, that's going to be proportional to the likelihood, this has all the information from the data, times all the information from the prior, and I need to, uh, of course, normalize that. But as it turns out, that if we just multiply these two, we will recognize it's going to be a Dirichlet distribution. So we can fill in this normalization factor. We don't have to actually compute it here. So I'm going to fill in here. This is proportional to this uh, likelihood term. This is actually the likelihood function. And I'm just picking out this guy here from the, uh, from the prior from you. Um, what's left over is a new Dirichlet distribution with an updated number of new Dirichlet distributions that you see here uh, with a big normalization factor that we don't really care about and an updated number of counts. Yeah, this makes sense, right? Um, we had or we assumed alpha k pseudo observations in the prior and we're making MK new ob observations now um, in, the, uh, in the actual data. And that's it, right? This is 
there's nothing else to be done. This is the posterior distribution for mu. This is what we know about mu after having observed, observed all uh, these data. And we're making use here of the fact that the Dirichlet and the categorical distribution are conjugate pairs, just like what we did for the coin toss, uh, the beta and the binomial are uh, also um, uh, conjugate pairs. And as before, we can now um, say, okay, so uh, then what, what is the probability that I'm gonna, uh, that the next throw after having observed this data, the next throw is going to land on the case phase. So the probability, the bullet here means n plus one or next uh, time step, uh, that it lands on the case phase, given now all my data, and I should have also here comma alpha, given my prior. Well, um, we can extend the conversation, as you may remember, um, I'm going to inter add basically mu the parameters that we've learned to this equation here and integrate it out. Uh, this here is our data generating distribution. This is just mu k. This, the posterior, is the Dirichlet with updated parameters, not just alpha, but also m. This whole thing here is basically the expected value of mu for the Dirichlet distribution. This is just an expectation. You can look that up at Wikipedia. This is what comes out. Um, it's going to be mk plus alpha k divided by the total number of observations plus the total number of pseudo observations, right? The total number of observations lands, landed on the case phase plus the uh, pseudo number of pseudo observations that landed on the case phase divided by the total number of observations. It makes total sense. Uh, without all these equations, you probably would have written down the same equation in the end. Um, so it's comforting to know that basically the Bayesian framework ends up with something that uh, speaks to our uh, intuition. Um, in this class, I, uh, I have a few remarks on relating this categorical to other well-known distributions, the multinomial and uh, some other distributions. And uh, we do some maximum likelihood estimation because that's supposed to be simpler. Um, and uh, you can do that in different ways and I go into that, but I don't foresee a lot of trouble there. So this is really the basics of uh, uh, Bayesian updating, Bayesian learning with discrete outcomes. And just like the Gauss, this is sort of the equivalent of the Gaussian distribution, the, uh, the categorical uh, distribution. And uh, just like in the Gaussian case, there's also very good reasons from an information theoretic perspective why you want to choose the categorical distribution. And uh, so this kind of updating, um, it seems really simple, and this is indeed a very simple model, um, but also in complex models and complex environments, um, this type of updating of the categorical uh, is an important module in your model, right? So it actually, uh, whenever you have discrete outcomes, you should be thinking about this kind of encoding and this kind of updating, no matter what the rest of the model uh, does, because you can have all kinds of priors and priors and priors, of course, but we'll be dealing with that uh, in, uh, in future lessons. So that's it. So uh, please uh, read through the lesson, uh, write down your questions, submit them, and then we'll discuss them in class. Bye.